Good evening all, and welcome. I'm working on a project of something quite fun that I think a lot of you might enjoy. However, in order to keep the word out, I would very much appreciate it if you guys could follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I've left the links at the top of the description, and it would mean a lot if you would check them out. So please consider it. But without further ado, it's time for us to dive into the heart of rural Australia. So get comfortable, grab a mate, and let the darkness take control. So I live in rural Australia, and this happened quite a few years ago, but is a story worth telling. The layout of our property consisted of a fairly standard four-bedroom house, and a massive shed that my dad used to keep all his furniture, machinery, and tools in. This shed was around 100 metres from the house, and had those lights that takes a while to warm up before lighting up properly. So I was around 17 at the time. It was the middle of winter, and it was getting dark at around 6pm. I was just finishing up working on my car in the driveway, when from the work shed, I hear my mum in a panic, scream for help. I sprinted up to the shed, the yelling continuing the whole time. I assumed she had walked into the shed for something, and instead of bothering with waiting for the lights, she walked in the dark and tripped on something. I ran into the shed and hit the lights, grabbing a torch, because it was pitch black inside. This closed the shed. I heard my mum yell my name once more clearly, in pain and coming from the far side of the shed. I started walking my way back to the shed, yelling to my mum, but not getting any replies. When I get about halfway, my dad sticks his head in the door and asks what I'm yelling about. I'm telling him about mum being in trouble and he pauses, and quickly tells me to get out of the shed and that mum is fine. Absolutely and completely confused, I walk back to the door of the shed, and both of us walk back to the house. I'm shaken, and I keep telling him I swear mum is hurt in the shed. When we get back to the house, mum walks out the front door, drying her hair with a towel after getting out the shower. I didn't know how to react. I explained to both of them what happened, and they both brush it off, saying it was weird, but that I probably imagined it. That weekend, my older sister who moved out two years before this event, came home for a visit. Sitting on the grass besides the house and the shed, I told her what happened, and she went white, and told me that a few years before she moved out, the exact same thing happened to her when she got home from work one night. Except mum, called my sister's phone when she was in the shed, wanting to know what she wanted for dinner. My sister never told a soul about her experience, only refused to ever go into the shed again. We both wondered what we would have found if we'd have gone to the back where the voice came from. This experience has bothered me for many years because I honestly don't know what to make of it. It has become one of those stories I tell around campfires, but this actually happened, and it still freaks me out when I think of it too much. I grew up on the east coast of Australia, and my family lived on a small country town on the edge of the rainforest. When I was 14, we rented a nice house on a few acres up a steep hill that ended in a cul-de-sac. The house was relatively nice, and sometimes I would go exploring the fire trails in the national forest behind us. I never found or saw anything weird. I don't even remember seeing any animals there either for some reason. Anyway, there was a deep, heavily forested gully with a small creek on the north side of the house that I never explored. Because one night, when I was home by myself, I heard something really weird. It sounded like screaming but it was a decent distance from our house, and it echoed through the gully. There were no other properties or houses between me and where the screaming seemed to be coming from, so I had no idea what was going on. It was eerie. I listened to it in the dark for a while, and then I decided to go inside and lock all the doors. I didn't tell anyone about this, 
and probably would have forgotten about it if it hadn't reoccurred several years later. By the time I was 17, we had brought a property and built a house down in the valley across the creek, not very far from where we were renting a few years prior. It was a beautiful property that was skirted by a nice little creek with thick rainforest on three sides. I had kept up my habit of exploring the surrounding areas on foot. And in my 4WD, I knew it like the back of my hand. We had a large circular driveway that came down to the house, wrapped around a large beech tree, and connected back up with the road at the top of the property. The east side of the driveway had heavy bushland, and one night, or early morning around 2am, I was coming home from my girlfriend's house, and my parents had left the front porch light on for me. I would always round the driveway and park the car on the east side incline besides the bushland, as I was locking the door to the 4WD. Just as I removed the key from the door, I heard it again in the bushland, maybe 20 to 30 meters in front of me. But the bush was so thick, I couldn't have even seen a meter into the scrub. The light from the porch just lit up a dark wall of vegetation. It was in that moment I realized that every horrific scream I had heard prior to that moment in my life was not totally real. This one was different. It was real. And the difference chilled me to the bone. This person, it sounded like a woman, was being hurt brutally, and seemed as though their lungs would turn inside out from the agony. It sounded like they were trying to cry for help but were in too much pain to make out any definite words. I stood there in shock for a moment, as I realized this scream was the same one I had heard years before, but this time closer. I went inside, and woke up my parents and we all stood on the front porch and listened for a few brief moments while we tried to decide what to do. My dad and I decided to investigate, and my mum called the police who would have been useless anyway, because we were so far out in the middle of nowhere. The screaming stopped, but we knew exactly where it was coming from. I grabbed a large cane knife, the best weapon I had in a country that outlaws firearms, and my father grabbed our spotlight. We got into the 4WD and drove around the bushland, shining the spotlight in the area where we were sure the noise had been coming from. There was nothing. The police never came. But we drove around for about an hour thinking maybe the source of the noise could have moved. But the scrub in that area was so thick, they wouldn't have been able to move very fast except on the fire trails we were using. And we covered those extensively in a short period of time on the 4WD. The next day, I fully expected there to be a news report of a grisly death in our area, which would have been very uncharacteristic of our lazy little town. I thought there was no way of whatever was making that noise would have been able to not leave a huge mess for someone to find. But there was nothing. I told a few people about this experience, but Australians are no nonsense kind of people and don't put much stock in the supernatural. So everyone thought it was just wild pigs or an owl. I knew it wasn't either of those. My parents and I knew what we heard, and we were sure it was human. One person was convinced that it was koalas mating. And when I insisted that this noise was human, the person said, Oh, yeah, that's what everyone who hears it thinks. So I thought that might be a possible explanation. But only for my own sanity. As far as I know, the noise was never heard again. And a few years later, my parents and brother moved out of state. And I was living in the US for university and was sharing this experience with some kind of friends late one night. And the point that koalas mating was kind of a funny punchline. Except this time one of my friends who was obviously interested in the relations of marsupials said, Have you ever looked up on YouTube to see if the sounds match up? I hadn't. So we spent a bit of time looking up videos of koalas mating. There were quite a few. And not one video sounded close to what we heard. So back to square one, with no explanation. Anyone have any idea what this could possibly be? I live in a very small town of about 100 people in rural New South Wales, Australia. 
This happened when my friends and I were 14. My town used to be a very close knit farming community. But the shift to modern times and the massive drought of the 2000s led to most of the businesses to be closed and farmers to move away. The aging population slowly died, and their houses were filled with despicable types, drug dealers and addicts, thieves and dull bludgers. It's sad really, but even now there are still great people here. What I've always found creepy is even though a very small population, and I've known just about everyone since before I can remember, there have always been people in the surrounding area that no one seems to know. Old loners mostly who keep to themselves and no one ever sees them. On top of that, there have been several depraved people with interests in minors. There have also been numerous break ins and attempted break ins in our homes, not to mention that for long stretches of time, we've been without a police officer, which means a 000 call would take an hour for help to arrive. It gets even creepier. The further the bush you go, I've heard of abandoned farmsteads where families have just vanished with all their belongings, including their cars left behind. There was even a multi generational inbred family reminiscent of the hills have eyes discovered a few years ago, though that was a few hundred miles from me. I grew up and went to primary school here. But we had to travel an hour to get to high school. It took quite a while for my closest childhood friends, Tim and I to make new friends. After two years of high school, we invited three friends to come out to town to go camping. Tim's parents owned a small property where they kept sheepdogs and horses a few miles from the town. We camped for five days there in the school holidays. The first night, as what often happens, we sat around the campfire telling stories. I told the story of some of those creepy loners I mentioned earlier, a pair of brothers that lived a few miles up the road from where we were camping. They were rarely ever seen, with a reputation of being creepy hillbilly hicks. I told them the story of how one night they had tried to cripple my father over him, supposedly stealing their business. They ambushed him at the local Weybridge at night. My father managed to fight both of them off, and my cousin also had a run in with them by taking a shortcut across their field, only to hear a firearm shot in his direction. My cousin had lied to me before, so I wasn't sure if it was true, but I made out like it was and later embellished their reputation with the normal inbred cannibal type crap city folk expect. On the second night, we decided to go for a night walk. We were kids and enjoyed fantasy movies and games and had a bit of role playing fun. One of us was too scared to go out in the dark. So on our walk, we decided to play a prank on him. We started screaming and running back to camp, saying, He got Henry. It worked, and our friend was scared. Zeb tried to climb an electric fence to escape. I, Henry, came back dirty and bloody, and we hid in a farmhouse until Tim ruined the prank by claiming he heard the brother skinned people, which caused us to burst out laughing. The next afternoon, we hiked up the nearest hill called Sims Gap Hill. It was a popular walk for Tim and I when we were kids. The fastest way to get to the hill was by taking the dirt road called the stock route, which ran parallel to the main tar road, which led to the town. The two roads are connected by another called sawmill road, which was at the base of the hill. We walked down the stock route and I pointed out the hillbilly brothers property as we went past it. All you can see from the road are piles of rusted old cars. We reached Sawmill Road and walked across the paddock to the hill and had an enjoyable time. We started climbing down the hill as it got late, but underestimated the time it took to walk across the paddock to the road. By the time we reached the road, it was night. And of course, it happened to be pitch black. As we started walking down Sawmill Road to the stock route, a pair of massive bright headlights turned onto the road from behind us. Naturally, we got off the road, which meant disappearing into the thick patch of trees between the road and the brother's property. As the lights caught up to us, the vehicle started slowing. Up until then, we had thought it was a farmer's ute, but now we realized it was a very old, very loud tractor. 
Not wanting to be questioned by any meddling adult, I tried to encourage the guys to hide. The tractor slowed right down and flashed a spotlight into the trees and then sped away. The guys asked me who it was and I said I didn't know. As we continued walking slowly, we saw the tractor turn around the stock route and then into the brother's property. Now I was unnerved. The tractor came roaring down the fence line and I yelled at the guys to run. We ran until we came to a small, well-hidden ditch, which we jumped in and lay very still. The tractor stopped right on us and they shined the spotlight over the trees. It didn't illuminate the ditch, luckily. The driver stopped and got off the tractor, walked over to the fence, and I peered up and saw the silhouette of a dirty, disheveled man with messy hair standing at the fence line looking around. In his hands was a rifle. In a nasally Aussie hillbilly voice, he yelled out, Where are you? We didn't dare move. I started thinking what we'd have to do if he climbed the fence and started coming our way. But he eventually turned around, got back on his tractor and left. It started with a groan and then rumbled down the other way. I got my friends up and we sprinted towards the stock route, ducking under branches and jumping over fallen trees. We hadn't quite hit it when the headlights were behind us again, roaring up Sawmill Road. We made it to the road and panicked. It was still two or three miles back to the camp and we wouldn't be able to outrun the tractor. On the other side of the stock route was a state forest with tens of miles of twisting dirt roads and motorbike trails and goat tracks. Despite how dark it was, with the strong possibility of getting lost, we dove in there. We hid as he went past us again, finding a forest road which led back to the general direction of town. We followed it for a while, wondering if he had given up and if it was safe to go back on the stock route. Then he was in front of us, blinding headlights roaring down the forest road. We jumped back in the trees and decided to run. We ran straight past him. Behind us, he turned back on the stock route and chased us again. He circled us four times with us hiding, then running, then hiding, then running. When we had gone far enough, that we thought we were close enough to the camp, we ran through the woods and jumped back on the stock route to be met by headlights. Tim's mother had come looking for us after finding our camp empty. She'd finally found us and we were still a mile or so from camp. We quickly piled in and she drove us back. We told her what happened, but she and my parents just said they're weird people and to stay away from them in future. I was living in Australia for a year. I was once a passenger carrier traveling through towns to get to the next destination. We were passing through rural towns in New South Wales that are small but still well populated. We pass by a field slash park where families are having picnics, enjoying the day, kids running around and playing. While I'm looking at the park and all the people in it with my head on the window, I all of a sudden see what looks like a grey zombie walking through it. It's walking right by families and people sitting down, but no one seems to take notice of this thing that's sticking out like a sore thumb. No one is looking up at what I assume is a freak in a Halloween costume when it's not Halloween. It's moving slowly and limping like a zombie would, but has a dead look in its eyes and its skin is grey. If my memory serves me correctly, even its clothes are grey. It's wearing tattered clothes and has a Frankenstein monster kind of air about it. That's the best way I can describe it. Like a grey zombie Frankenstein monster. My eyes follow it the entire time while my bus passes the park, which is only for a moment. But the thing that freaks me out the most is how it's passing by all these families and no one is paying any attention to it. The thing is, it didn't necessarily seem evil to me, just sad. It didn't make eye contact with me. It was just walking slowly and sadly through the park. This huge grey guy is dressed up as Frankenstein's monster, painted grey on this sunny day, and no one even took notice of him. I don't know what to make of it. A very short 10 second psychosis on my part, 
or something supernatural. I also wanted to share this with you to see if any other Aussies know any legends that resemble what I saw, or if anyone has had a similar experience, because I can't explain this strange humanoid and can't find anything similar regarding this encounter. This story dates back to July last year. It has enough weirdness that I find myself puzzling over exactly what happened quite regularly. My friends reactions sometimes make me wonder if this is just a big old self gaslighting experience. But yet, when I go over the details, there is enough deep weirdness that it only leaves two real options. I'll let you be the judge. A few years ago, my best friend Toby took a cross country grand position in Brisbane, a big tumulus thing for our group of friends. And amid the three and power drunk confessionals and promises to not lose touch was a promise of the road trip. However, life found a way to make our drunk promises seem very disingenuous. And 18 months later, we'd hardly spoken barring a few crowded hours when he'd flown over for a family obligation. Eventually the stars aligned mid July last year, and myself, Toby, and two other friends, Chris and Alec, were able to get the band back together. Queensland is a weird mix of tropical paradise, dead space, crocodiles, and genuine social backwardsness. Queensland is very, very much the Florida of Australia. Australia is huge, not just huge, but vast and extremely empty. There is on average 3.1 people every square kilometer. And 90% of those people live in seven or eight major cities. If you think Reddit is an echo chamber, you've never had the pleasure of sinking a few cooling through these with a good old boys in outback Queensland. The Australian geography makes it really easy to get 100% removed from society. And is something I often appreciate about the country. But the distance can be daunting at times because if things go wrong, nothing is close. Everything is amplified by distance. Our plan was to fly in, cram four dudes and two weeks worth of supplies into Toby's family sedan and straight book it 1600 kilometers north from Brisbane to Cairns. Being fiscally unendowed on a time schedule and outdoors inclined, we opted to keep driving most nights until we found an interesting slash free campsite to pitch up in, which was a complex process of cross reference and driver fatigue with the relative passive aggression of campsite comments with the wiki camps app worth every single penny if you ever travel in Australia. Generally speaking, we opted for road stops. But one night after staying too late in a particularly nice town, 1770, if anyone is playing at home, and reading a few particularly average reviews of the rest stop up the road, we decided to go off pissed and camp at an unmarked but seemingly well known campsite. Around 9pm, we took a left off the highway followed the wiki camps directions towards our campsite about 2.5 kilometers away from the Bruce Highway. Despite the remoteness, we found the campsite, a small 30 meter clearing between the banks of an apparent croc filled river and tall gum trees already occupied by a single caravan attached to a four wheel drive. Being quite familiar with camping, I felt a little awkward intruding on what I'm sure the caravan owners assumed was a private spot. Well after dark, and made a mental note to smooth over any grievances with a cup of tea and a good day. Should we see the owners before we left? We started setting up the camp, despite this frustratingly gravel thick soil. Have you ever tried beating a tent peg into a rock? We weren't being particularly loud, but must have attracted our neighbor's attention because he flung open the caravan door within two minutes of us arriving and started one of the weirdest conversations I have ever had. Expecting a grey nomad couple and a please keep it down. I was surprised by the 55 ish, bushy bearded man that approached us. He seemed erratically drunk and asked us if we had a bong, which we did not. I offered him a beer and he asked where we were from. 
We mentioned Perth, and he asks our names. We went around the group, and we asked his. Oh, don't worry about that. And then he cleared his throat and made a joke. You know, I'm a gay prostitute. Mutual unexpected statement silence. Yeah, I'm great, but the other boys don't enjoy it as much. There was awkward laughter. It was also important to note that Chris and Alec were not particularly interested in this conversation, preoccupied with tense. Minimal attention was being paid, and Toby had made more an effort to engage, but was tending to his swag, and I was more or less solely engaged in the conversation. Despite his awful joke, which I talked up to different cultural sensitivities, I asked us if he minded us camping here. And what was he up to tonight? Oh no, I'm just watching the state of origin. Rugby. You know, I'm having trouble making friends. He pondered for 10 seconds or so and then followed up with, I used to have a good friend, but he was a crossdresser. So I had to take care of him. He said it so naturally that my general human statement interpreter thought it was an off joke and auto response had already kicked in by the time I realized what he had just said. Oh, how far is the river from here? Are we in range of any crocs? I asked before my brain could work out. Oh, why? Oh, only 150 meters that way with the shallow graves. You know, my friend knows where some shallow graves are up in Hervenly Bay. But yeah, you know, being out here alone, I wouldn't worry about the crocs. Do you promise not to kill me if I promise not to kill you? This was enough to trigger my dumb lizard brain and a very rapid understanding of danger kicked in. Oh, do you think Queensland will win the state of origin? It would be embarrassing to lose all three games. What's the score anyway? I asked in an attempt to show I'm less scared of the snake than it is of me. Good point. Just come knock if you want some bourbon boys, he said, as he walked the 10 meters to his caravan. I immediately turned to Toby and asked how much of that conversation he'd heard. He said not much, but enough to be a little shaken. And I asked if Toby had caught our bearded friend's name, and he replied he had not. I immediately insisted to my friend that we take a walk to the river, despite Alec repeatedly saying, I'll be there in five, just let me finish my tent. I made it very clear that we needed to see that river right now, in the very remote dark, we huddled around a smartphone torch, and I explained the conversation I had just had with our nameless gentleman. Alec and Chris again had only heard this guy being friendly, and asked our names and certainly didn't understand why I was being so edgy. Despite my being fully aware that we were in an actual horror movie, I agreed to keep setting up and wait to see if anything happened. I immediately started scoping sizable rocks to use in a mano a mano fight to the end, should it come down to it. And 10 seconds after considering it, I asked Toby what we should do if our mate Mick Taylor happened to have a firearm. He paused very briefly and then very quietly and aggressively pronounced we should get the hell out of there. We packed up extremely rapidly, one eye on the caravan at all times and despite protestations from Alec, we got the hell out of there. I still have no idea if this guy was trying to play a big old joke on four mid twenties guys, or if there was something more sinister behind it. You can get away with a lot more if no one's around, and there aren't a whole load of people looking in rural Queensland. Either way, I'd rather never meet again. I live in Australia, so it gets quite hot, even during the night, which leads us to leaving the windows open a fair bit for air. But every so often I will hear this kind of otherworldly purr from outside the window. It's like nothing I've ever heard before, but it's always very quiet, barely above a whisper. Once I had a friend stay at my house for the night, and the window next to my bed was open. We were playing a Pokemon Nuzlocke together, and then suddenly there was a loud growl but from an animal I'd never heard before. It scared the absolute crap out of both of us and we went straight to bed. In the Christmas holidays, I went to see my family and my sister was there. And I'd asked her if she'd ever heard anything similar. 
because my room used to be hers before she moved out. And she told me she used to hear weird growls and other noises outside her window at night. As of the time of writing this, I'm kind of freaking out. I've only heard this one time, but it was hot, and I opened my window about 10 minutes ago and heard it again. Am I looking too far into this? Or is this a strange animal? What do you guys think? Because I am decidedly unsure. Last year, I moved to rural Australia from the city to do some farm work with my boyfriend. He's from the UK and to allow a second year visa, he needed to complete 88 days on a farm. So I quit my job and went with him. We stayed in a working hostel and people worked in farms all around the area. We lived slightly out of town, close to the highway and about 15 minutes from the beach. My boyfriend managed to get a job before I did, which meant a lot of boring days by myself at the hostel. It was early in the season, so there weren't many backpackers yet. Anyway, one of the boring days I decided to maybe go to the beach, so I drove into town. The town is surrounded by three beaches, like a square on the edge of the sea, if that makes sense. One of the beaches was a bit further away, and I hadn't been that many times, so I thought I'd check out the other one instead. It was the middle of the day, and this is a small town and there's no one else around. I pulled in the car park, and as I did, I noticed another car pull onto the car park too. It was a tradesman work van, with a company logo on the side. For some reason, I didn't get out of the car right away. I just had a funny feeling. I look over into the van about two car spaces distance between ours, and the guy looks at me and stares. He was an older man, I'd say mid 40s, and had a very blank expression. The feeling of uneasiness I messaged my boyfriend, telling him I was at the beach just in case. While I'm doing this, Van Guy jumps out of his car and walks in front of my car along the path to the entry of the beach and heads down it. The path down to the beach is fenced to protect the sand dunes, so there's only one way in and out the beach area. I remember thinking it was weird he was walking down on the beach as he was in jeans and a button down shirt and black shiny business shoes, strange attire for a sandy beach in Australia in 35 degree heat. I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling, but I also could just be thinking the worst of this situation. Just to be safe, I thought I'd drive to one of the other beaches on the other side of town just to be sure. By this time, Van Guy is out of sight and presumably down on the other beach. So I pull out the car park and drive over to one of the other beaches. Now I have to explain the layout to give a little perspective. This other beach is on the complete other side of town, not on a main road, and you really wouldn't want to head down there without living nearby or heading to the beach. The entrance to the car park is a small one way road that is like an L shape with cars parked along it and then an exit at the end. It's a small car park with a street just over the other side with only a few houses on it. So I pull into the empty car park, park my car in the first space, grab my beach bag. And as I'm about to get out the car, I see a van in my rear view mirror. It pulls over quickly across from the street from the entrance to the car park. This time he doesn't get out. At this point, I was too freaked out to get out the car. It just all seemed too weird. So I quickly drove home and stayed inside the rest of the day. I just couldn't shake that weird feeling. A lot of strange things happened in that town. It was like a pass by town people traveled through a lot to get to major cities. Yeah, this encounter was strange though. I never saw the man or his van again, but I didn't venture out on my own after that. I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked down on the beach path. Was he waiting for me? The other thing is that he was at the other beach literally seconds after I was. So that would mean from where he was, he would have had to run up the beach pathway, get into his car to be there that fast. And why park right opposite the entrance to see if I got out my car? These are the questions that have bothered me about this scenario. Do you think I'm paranoid? Or did he have any intentions? I guess we'll never know. I live in rural Australia, 
in a neighborhood a few kilometers away from a small town next to the beach. This neighborhood is pretty much just thick forest, some roads and maybe 20 houses scattered around. I get dropped off from school at a bus stop with a neighbor where I have to walk about a kilometer through thick bush and forest to get home. One day when I was in sixth grade, I was on the bus home from school. As we got close to my neighborhood, I started seeing more and more police cars parked on the side of the road, and even an NRMA helicopter flying around. Me and my friends thought it was weird, but didn't think too much of it. I got off the bus with my friend and noticed that their mum was waiting for them. Again, a bit strange, but nothing crazy. I said goodbye and started walking off when my friend's mum called me over. I walked over and she told me that there was a shirtless, panicked man on the loose in our area. He was also wounded and had a weapon that the police wouldn't disclose. She said that he was meant to be extremely dangerous and that I should come home to her place instead of walking home through the bush. I was scared, but I got to my friend's house so I didn't complain. On the drive there, we made up heaps of theories, but none of them turned out to be true. We got to their place and I just hung around until my mum could leave work to fetch me. I got back to my house and started talking to my mum. By now, there were police cars everywhere and about 10 helicopters scanning the area. My mum and dad said that the police had told them his name and some more details about him. He was an addict with a bad criminal record that had apparently been wounded in a fight and ran off. He was rumored to have a firearm and was apparently in our backyard at one point. At the exact time I would have been coming home from school. That was close. The helicopters kept on tracking him by report and sightings and eventually he left the area. Later that night, police called up the residents and told them he had been caught. We slept okay knowing we weren't gonna perish. But the next morning it turned out he hadn't actually been caught. I can't remember who told us, but he was certainly still on the loose. It was also found out that before he came to our neighborhood, he had assaulted a woman and stolen her car and drove into our area because of the kilometers and kilometers of thick forest to hide in. A bunch of other stuff also came up involving in drug trafficking and that he had been crashing with some drug dealers in one of my friend's neighboring houses. There were a bunch more things that led me to believe there was something else very fishy going on. The police got sniffer dogs in later that day and they kept searching to no avail. After a week, he still wasn't caught and a class trip had to be canceled because he was still in the area. But some weeks later, they finally apprehended him. And that case was closed. There's still a lot of confusion and some weird things that happened and the police won't share any details, but he was caught. So that's fine, I guess. I come from a chaotic upbringing. I was born and raised as a child in South Korea and then later moved to Australia with my mother having lost my father in a homicide. The next few years of my life in Australia were difficult. Meeting and making friends was challenging in the early noughties, particularly since I was quite nerdy and didn't speak much English, something most Australian kids at the time did not relate to well. One of the scariest moments was from when I was age 12. At the time, it didn't even occur to me how close I was from potentially losing my life. My mother and I were on a road trip heading south from Melbourne to stay on the southern coast. We had stopped one evening at a small, well-kept caravan park. The caravan park was quaint and beautiful, neat grass, nice flowers, and a small creek which ran along the edge of the premises. It reminded me of home. I spent some time walking around on my own as my mother was taking a nap and I discovered a game and a pool room. I went inside and spent probably a few hours playing pool by myself and generally just mucking around when a young boy came in. I was very shy and so was he. So we eventually talked for a little bit and became friendly. I don't remember playing any games with him, but I do recall him being pretty nervous. 
He kept asking me if I wanted to go back to his caravan as his parents were making dinner soon. At first, I wasn't interested and said no. We spent some more time doing things and talked as it got later, and he became more pushy and asked me if I liked cake and lollies. Of course, I said. I followed him to his caravan, which was much older than ours and quite dilapidated. He asked for me to wait outside while he spoke to his parents. I waited patiently for a few minutes until the door opened and a large older man with glasses and no shirt opened the door and asked if I would like to come inside for cake. I was scared, but I remember feeling like I had to, like it would be rude for me to leave. And as I walked into the door, I heard a man shout behind me, Hey, what's going on here? I was quickly grabbed from my collar of my shirt, or dress, and the man then quickly tried to lock the door behind me. However, the stranger was too quick and burst in the door. He took my hand abruptly and pulled me outside and we ran. The man asked which unit room slash caravan I was in and took me straight there. We went inside and my mum yelled at him asking what he was doing there. I was hiding in the corner crying while he explained what happened. We packed up and left that night. I was already heavily on anxiety medication after what happened back home, and we never spoke of it again. My mother claimed it was something I should talk to my therapist about. Every time we spoke about it, my mother would leave the room. It scared the hell out of her, and I did not really understand why. I guess at that age, it's difficult for the brain to comprehend the reality slash potential of a situation. Looking back on it now, it scares me to the point of losing sleep. I'm just glad that Good Samaritan possibly saved my life. This happened to me about 10 years ago, and stays with me vividly as one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced, and I don't usually believe in paranormal things. Our family were renovating a very old house in rural Australia, over 100 years old, which we were about halfway through the renovation. We were staying in another small outhouse while doing the renovation, but we had family and friends coming to stay with us, so I had to forfeit my normal bedroom and stay in the main house in a tent as it was nowhere near ready to sleep in. Most of the nights, I woke around 3 a.m. to our working dogs about 200 meters away from the house, going absolutely nuts barking at something, but I usually didn't pay much attention to them, as kangaroos often jump near their kennels and set them off some nights. As their barking came to a stop, I could faintly hear crisp and clear footsteps out the room I was in and down the hallway, getting louder and clearly slower, making their way towards my room. I didn't think much of it at first, but the direction the noise was coming from was so clear. The footsteps slowly made their way up to the room and hallway and stopped at what I thought to be the doorway of the room. I was locked up with fear at what the hell was standing in the doorway and trying to figure out what I could do. And then it started moving again, only this time straight towards my tent and stopped right next to it and I was waiting for the tent to start shaking, but it only stopped for a brief second and then walked into the corner of the room and stopped. The fear I felt at that moment kept me paralyzed for what felt like hours. I was sweating and had a blanket over me and was too afraid to move. After a while, I eventually calmed down enough to get my light I had with me, open the zippers of the tent and look out to which I found nothing in the room. So I climbed back into the tent and somehow managed to get back to sleep, as I never heard anything more. In the morning, I woke up fairly early and went back over to the little outhouse and tell my parents my story and asked them if they were just messing with me, but they were adamant they didn't do anything. To add to the strange noise of the footsteps, there were loose floorboards all over the hallway floor, drying out, spaced tightly together, getting ready to be put down in the coming weeks. So I decided to try and replicate those footstep noises, but couldn't, as the boards on the floor would move and make completely different sounds. To this day, I'm still not sure if it was just my head playing tricks on me, or if there was something strange going on in that house. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. As I said at the start, it would mean a lot to me if you'd follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I am working on something fun and it would definitely help me out to keep to keep the word to
Just keep spreading the word. That's what I was trying to say. And I genuinely think you won't regret it. Don't worry, I don't often tweet a whole lot of random garbage. I only tweet generally important things. Now, I'm not saying other people tweet random garbage. Well, actually, I am. They do. Lots of people tweet random crap. But I'm just saying that I'm not one of those people. I, I really limit, limit it unless I have something important to say or something cool to share. In any case, I, it would mean a lot to me if you would follow me over there and on Instagram, because when the time comes, you're going to want to be informed. Believe me. Well, as always, a huge thank you to my lovely patrons. This video was actually suggested to me by one of those lovely patrons. Well, not suggested, requested by use of a power token. If you'd like to get your hands on the power to pick your own topics every month, feel free to check out my Patreon, as well as be credited like the people now and a whole load of other funky stuff. So please be sure to let me know. So yeah, there's all of that. If there's a story that you'd like to share, please share it with me, info in the description. And I hope you all enjoyed Australian Outback stories. Perhaps there'll be more in future. In any case, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.